serve the almighty God of creation. Those that serve Him in humility and obedience should never worry, should never threat, would never fret. Good morning, brothers and sisters. How are we doing today? We got to see smiles. It's a Sabbath. We're in the house of the Lord. You should be smiling from ear to ear and it shouldn't start, it shouldn't stop till you walk in the door and you walk out and the sun goes down and then you can still smile. Amen. Smile, God loves you. You are in His house today. He has a message for each one of us because He loves us and He wants to see each of us in His eternal kingdom. And I remind you again, Jesus is coming soon. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. I don't know about you, but I'm done with this world. Amen. Pain, suffering, sickness, death. Everyone in this room has went through it. In one way or another. It's time to go home. Amen. It's time to go home. And we see God moving in miraculous ways. Today, just today, we have a group of our young people, young adults, out at Lake Jackson Church. As you know, we have been doing a great controversy handout here since January. There's been over 7,000 handed out since January here. Amen. The word's getting around. Amen. The Church of Lake Jackson asked for our people to come train their people so they can do it as well. The message is getting out to the world Amen. because Jesus is coming soon Amen. and we have a work to do. Amen. I want you to keep this event of the soon coming of our Savior ever in front of you. Let it mark everything you do in your life. Everything you do should point to the soon coming of Jesus and being ready for that soon coming. Amen? Amen. Now today, I never start out by doing sermon series. I let the Lord lead in the Holy Spirit. I study and I go the direction He has me go. You know the sermon last week. How many were here last week? Brothers and sisters, I stepped down from here and I asked the Lord, what just happened? I did not expect that message. I didn't expect it to come out that way, but the Holy Spirit moved. Amen. And as I was studying this week, I was impressed that we have a part two. We're not finished yet. See, we just started out at the 40 years when the 40 years started before they crossed over in the Jordan. Brothers and sisters, a lot happened between that 40 years and when they actually crossed the Jordan River. Our pastor, our world pastor, Ted Wilson, gave us a message that I fully believe was inspired by the Holy Spirit. That was a message for the world church to move forward for the next five years. That was a message for each one of us. That message is very full of much for us to comprehend and take hold of and use in our daily lives. And what did he tell us over and over again? He said, cross the Jordan, do not retreat. Cross the Jordan, do not retreat. And we're going to be talking part two of crossing the Jordan and what it means for us today to cross the Jordan into the heavenly Canaan. Amen? Amen. We are told in the spirit of prophecy that our experience today will mirror the children of the Exodus experience. In last day events, page 60, it is said, in these last days, God's people will be exposed to the very same dangers as were ancient Israel. Those who will not receive the warnings that God gives will fall into the same perils as did ancient Israel and come short of entering into the rest through unbelief. Brothers and sisters, sit and think on that for a moment. I want to get back to where we start here. Remind you, our messages are now up on YouTube. But we, before we get into the message, I kind of got it, got started too quick, brother. I'm excited to share the Word of God with you. But first, we have been going through the fundamental beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And then we have a memory scripture that we take home for the week and we memorize. So let's look at the fundamental belief number 11 of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is growing in Christ. It says, by his death on the cross, Jesus triumphed over the forces of evil. Amen? 
He who subjugated the demonic spirits during his earthly ministry has broken their power and made certain their ultimate doom. Jesus' victory gave us victory over the evil forces that still seek to control us as we walk with Him in peace, joy, and assurance of His love. Now the Holy Spirit dwells within us and empowers us. Continually committed to Jesus as our Savior and Lord, we are set free from the burden of our past deeds. No longer do we live in the darkness, fear of evil powers, ignorance, and meaningless of our former way of life. In this new freedom in Jesus, we are called to grow into the likeness of His character, communing with Him daily in prayer, feeding on His Word, meditating on it and on His providence, singing His praises, gathering together for worship, and participating in the mission of the church. As we give ourselves in loving service to those around us and in witnessing to His salvation, His constant presence with us, through the Spirit transforms every moment and every task into a spiritual experience. Amen. Amen. Now, our scripture to memorize for the week, to go along with fundamental belief, number 11, is found in Galatians 5, 24 and 25. Please read along with me. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit... Let us also walk in the Spirit. Amen. Amen. I am very thankful for this new table. I do not have to bend down for my water now. Thank you. Crossing the Jordan. The rest of the story. Before we move any further, you know what we have to do. I have to lift this up to the Lord in prayer. Because He is the one that speaks from this pulpit. I am just the vehicle. Please bow with me. Father in heaven, I thank you for this wonderful Sabbath day. I thank you for each one of your children here, Lord. There's a reason we're here today. You have a message for each one of us, including the speaker, Lord. I am no better, no better than anyone else here. Please speak to my heart as I share your message with your people. May your Holy Spirit move. May your Holy Spirit speak through me. Let your words be heard, not my own. If I attempt to put my words in there, shut me up, Lord. It is all about what you have for us today. May your spirit guide us and direct us through this message to help prepare us for your eternal kingdom. Again, Lord, I thank you for your love, your mercy. Thank you for answering this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, last week we know we talked about the rebellion that started the 40-year wandering in the desert. We were talking about the rebellion that started in Numbers 13. The rebellion that happened when 12 spies were sent into the promised land and they came back and 10 of them came back with a discouraging report with lies. Two of them, we know Caleb and Joshua, came back with a positive, true report. The two that came with a positive, true report trusted God, trusted God's word that He had told them in Exodus 6 verse 8. He said, I will give you the promised land. I will take you safely into it. These two trusted the Word of God. Last week's message was the Word or the world. You have two options. The Word or the world. You are either going to trust in God's Word or you are going to trust in yourself, which is trusting in the world. Everyone has a choice to make. As we know, ten trusted in the world, in themselves. They started lying. That led to the whole group of the children of Israel to complaining. We know the path to apostasy moves on. Then it moves into rebellion. Rebellion is speaking out in rebellion. Rebellion turns to revolt. Revolt is when you take action in rebellion. And finally, that leads to apostasy. Leaving God altogether. And we know apostasy has only one ending. And that ending is death. And we saw that the children, those that complained and murmured and started this rebellion, were told by God that they would not enter into the promised land. So now let us continue this journey. This journey that started 40 years before the crossing of the Jordan. And let's see the lessons, lessons and the warnings that God has for us today. Turn with me 
in your Bibles to Numbers 14, 29 through 30. We will start in Numbers 14, 29 and 30. See, the rebellion didn't just end there when God told them that they were not going to enter the promised land. They took it one step further. Here's God, what He said to them. He said in 29, He said, The carcasses of you who have complained against Me shall fall in this wilderness. All of you who were numbered according to your entire number from 20 years old and above. Except for Caleb the son of Juneth, And Joshua the son of Nun, you shall by no means enter this land which I swore I would make you dwell in. By complaining and rebelling, they set up their own fate and God told them they would not enter the promised land. But He did make a promise that the two spies that come back with the positive report, the two that had trusted in the Word of God, He said these two will enter the promised land. Brothers and sisters, let the heart of Caleb and Joshua be your heart today. Trust in the word of the Lord and you will enter into the heavenly Canaan. Amen? Amen. Trust in the word of the Lord. We know that those that didn't enter the Canaan land did not trust God's word. They trusted the word of ten lying men. Look at verse 35 and 37. It says, I, the Lord, have spoken this, will surely do so to all this evil congregation who are gathered together against me in this wilderness. They shall be consumed, and there they shall die. Now the men whom Moses sent to spy out the land who returned and made all the congregation complain against him by bringing a bad report of the land... These very men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before the Lord. The judgment was those ten men that brought the evil report. Those leaders died by the plague right then and there. The followers were told that they would die before the group of Israel entered the promised land. It's a sad day. In Israel. Now, these that had rebelled against God, then they decide, Lord, we have sinned against the Lord. We have sinned against the Lord. Now we got to do something about it. What we're going to do, we're going to trust the Lord now. They should have trusted the Lord when He said, You can take it, because God never meant for the promised land to be taken by force. Amen? But they said, Now, We're going to trust the Lord what He said and we're going to go and we're going to take the promised land by force. Brothers and sisters, God never said this. Look at verse 44. Speaking of these rebellious children, He said, But they presumed to go up to the mountaintop. Nevertheless, neither the ark of the covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed from the camp. They decided to go take Canaan without their leader Moses, and more importantly, without the Ark of the Covenant. They decided to do it in their own strength. Again, still in rebellion. They presumed that they could take this land. Even though God said no, what did God just say? No, you're not going to enter that land. Amen? Amen? And they presumed, because he had said it before, they went back to his earlier statement. doesn't work that way. Look at verse 15, uh, chapter 15, verse 30 and 31. The law was put out concerning presumptuous sin. It says, But the person who does anything presumptuously, whether he is native-born or a stranger, that one brings reproach on the Lord, and he shall be cut off from among his people. Because he has despised the word of the Lord and has broken His commandment, that person shall be completely cut off. His guilt shall be upon him. Brothers and sisters, presumption is a snare of the devil. Do not presume anything. 
Trust in God's word alone. Presumption is the opposite of faith. Trust in God's word. Presume nothing. For our God, in His Word, He means what He says, but He means what He says for our own good. Our God is not a God that says something just because He wants to say, because I said so. He always has a reason why He says it and is meant for our own good. He alone can see the future. We cannot. Trust in God. Trust in His Word. These presumption many, they went up into Canaan. And as the story goes, many thousands died because of their presumption. So for a time, the children of Israel were subdued. They were subdued by this defeat. They were subdued because of many deaths. But the story continues. Let's look at the next big event that happened. The rebellion always, if not completely wiped out, always comes back bigger and greater. Now today I tell you, we're not going to concentrate fully on the rebellion of the people. Because that's not where we're at, right? That's not where we want to be, right? We don't want to rebel against God in any way. Because rebellion against God is death. We want to enter the kingdom. And what we're going to concentrate on after we get through this 40 year phase of rebellion, we are going to concentrate on how to get in the kingdom. This message will end in a positive manner, so don't get down because we're talking about the rebellion of the people that actually mirrors us today. Be ready. God has more for us. Hang in. Trust in the Lord. So the next big event, well, before I say that, I said let us not concentrate on these rebellions. But those of us that have rebellion in our heart for any reason, any personal rebellion, whether it's criticisms, whether it's murmurings, whether it's worldliness, whether it's just selfishness, I want to do it my way, Lord, let it go. Repent. Now is the time, brothers and sisters. We are living in the final days of the earth's history. And this message comes to you in mercy from the Lord. Because He knows. I don't think we even know, understand how short time is. But He does. And that's why we get these messages today. To get us ready. It's not to hurt our feelings. It's not to make us feel bad about our lives. It's to tell us, brother, sister, son, daughter, get right with me. This is God speaking to us. Get true to my word. I want you in the kingdom. I want you here to live eternally with me. This is God's plea to each and every one of us today. Please, as He speaks to each one of your hearts, only He knows what's going on in your mind between you and Him. Heed His call. Listen to His call. Repent. Make the changes that He's talking to each one of us today to change. Because He loves us and wants us in His kingdom. Amen? Amen. Now, this next big event, this next big rebellion, we find in number 16. We know it popularly as the rebellion of Korah. Why did this rebellion come about? The last one was a total distrust in God. This one come from a different angle. There were many rebellions during this 40 years. This one came through jealousy, through pride. Just the way Satan's rebellion started in heaven, amen? amen. Satan himself said, I will be like the Most High. Korah had the same thing in his heart. He wanted something that God had not ordained. Korah wanted to be a priest. But we know our God is a God of organization and structure. He sets things the way He wants them to be for His reasons. We are to follow them. If we don't understand, you know what? Make it to the kingdom, make it to heaven, and ask Him. 
Why? But now, living on this earth, if the word says it, is not the time to ask why. Now is the time to follow the word, explicitly obey. Amen? Because obedience will get you into the kingdom where you can ask why then. This rebellion started the same as the spies' rebellion in 13. It started with lies. Then moved to complaints. Then moved to rebellion. To revolt. And finally death and apostasy. Look at 16, 3 and 4. Chapter 16, 3 and 4. Here we talk, we're talking about Korah. It says, They gathered together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, You take too much upon yourselves, for all the congregation is holy, every one of them, and the Lord is among them. Why then do you exalt yourselves above the assembly of the Lord? So when Moses heard it, he fell on his face. Do you hear this same thing being said today? The whole congregation is holy. Yes, we are a holy priesthood. But again, I tell you, God is a God of organization and structure, and He has a way. And it's found clearly in His Word. Amen? Now look at verses 13 and 14. And pay attention to this because we're going to go through a little bit of theme in the rebellion. You're going to see something that comes up over and over through these examples of the rebellion. It says, Is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey to kill us in the wilderness that you should keep acting like a prince over us? Moreover, you have not brought us into a land flowing with milk and honey nor given us an inheritance of the field. Will you put out the eyes of these men? We will not come up. Verse 13, is it a small thing that you have brought us up out of a land flowing with milk and honey? Last I checked, the land they were brought out of Egypt was not a land flowing with milk and honey. I believe it was a land of slavery. It started, the complaining, the murmuring, started with lies. Do you see? Will you even put our eyes out? Like Moses was going to put their eyes out. They attributed things to Moses that were absolutely weren't true to raise the people up in rebellion. Rebellion always starts with lies. Now this rebellion, we saw the last one, the instant deaths were only 10 leaders. This one, you know the story as Moses set it out. They called them forward with their censors to say, okay, let God decide who's holy and who should be priests. 250 of the leading men, the princes of Israel, came forward with their censors. 250 men that were not supposed to be priests. And these 250 men were destroyed by the Lord. Korah, Dathan, and Abram were swallowed up by the ground with their whole families. God spoke that day. Praise the Lord and thank the God that He doesn't speak that way to us instantaneously. But... God is no respecter of persons and a day will come we will pay the same way they paid. We will pay for the same sins. But thank God for His mercy today that some of the things we do, the ground just doesn't open up and swallow us whole. I'm thankful. (laughs) 250 leaders died and before all was said and done over up to 15,000 people had died. Brothers and sisters, I believe we went through it last week. You saw the scriptures. I believe we have a similar rebellion going on right now and this pure revolt portion of it is coming very soon. See it. Prepare your heart and mind. See it. Don't be a part of it. Know it's coming. Know it's there. But I'm going to show you we have something to concentrate on elsewhere. Next came the next rebellion. Moved to Numbers 20, verses 2 and 5. Numbers 20, verses 2 and 5. 2 through 5, I'm sorry. This we'll call the Water Rebellion. 
I might have been part of that as much water as I drink. I pray I wouldn't be. It says, Now there was no water for the congregation. So they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke and saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come up out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? Is it not a place of grain or figs and vines and pomegranates? Nor is there any water to drink. The children of Israel had lost faith in God once again. Here they are. They've been wandering the desert for some time. Never once have they went thirsty. And all of a sudden they see no water there. And they start flipping out. Trust in God was gone. They did not trust in God's word. I remind you from Exodus 6, 8. God said, I will bring you through. I will bring you to the promised land. The water rebellion. They didn't trust in God's word. Again and again and again, that's what we saw for the children of Israel wandering in the desert was a lack of faith in God's word. But what else did we see in verse 5? And it says, why have you bring us come up out of Egypt? Again, they bring up Egypt. Now we know in the Bible, Egypt represents the world, worldliness. These children of Israel were longing for the world. Every time in rebellion, it's because they had a nice, nice thoughts about the world. They would rather be back in the world. Brothers and sisters, this is the rub for us. We live in a sinful world. A world that attacks us on a daily basis. A world that many of us have succumbed to. Many of us play a part in this world and for, quite frankly, many of us love the world too much. You love the world too much, you are in danger of rebelling against God. Now with this mistake, the judgment came. Actually, the children of Israel got Moses to sin through this one. Moses was so upset with them, so angry with them, that he went out and struck the rock and did not attribute the water source to God. He said, must I and Aaron, must we do everything? Must we do the water for you? I don't know exactly how he said it. I'm going to look it up here. But he didn't attribute it to God. And for that one sin, Moses was God's leader. Moses was God's man. But God is no respecter of persons. And Moses was a leader. So God had to deal with Moses. And he told Moses, because of this sin, you cannot enter the promised land. But Moses dealt with it the way we need to deal with these things when God speaks to us. Moses took it humbly and moved on and continued working for the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Moses trusted even though God told him that he was not going to enter the holy land, the promised land, that God had a plan for him. And you know what? When Moses died, he woke up and found he was ascending to heaven. God had something better for him. So even though it looks like, yes, he was severely disappointed that he couldn't enter the land of Canaan. you got to believe that. He wanted so much to do that. He'd been with these leading, these Israelites, year after year after year. And the one goal was to enter into the land of Canaan. Moses wanted that as much as anybody else. But when God told him, that because of his sin, he wouldn't enter. He accepted it and moved on. And God rewarded him greatly. Amen. Moses is one of the few men that are in heaven right now today, Amen. looking down on us. God has a better plan for you always. Trust in the word of God. Amen? Amen. Now, the other judgment was the people were going to move straight through the land of Edom. But now the people, because they complained, they were going to have to move around the land of Edom. Well, God set this up for another chance for them to exercise their faith. Turn with me now to Numbers 21, verses 5 through 6. 5 and 6. 
Numbers 21, 5 and 6. This would be the rebellion we'll call the rebellion of the fiery serpents. Many have heard of this story as well. Numbers 21, 5 and 6. It says, And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Here it is again, guys. It sounds like a broken record. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food, no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. This rebellion was complaining about the mercies, the blessings of God. Here He is, He's raining bread down from heaven to feed them. And they're saying, why do we have to eat this loathsome bread? They're complaining against the blessings of God. So God said, okay, you want to complain? I'm going to give you a reason to complain. God had been holding back all kinds of things from them. We are told that their clothes didn't wear out. Their shoes didn't wear out. They always had what they needed. So God said, okay, you want to complain? Here you go. And He allowed what He was holding back in the desert. All these poisonous snakes to enter the camp. These snakes that He was holding back, He was blessing them. And He said, okay, you guys truly don't understand blessings. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to see. They came in, and again we are told, thousands died from the painful bites of these fiery serpents. The Bible calls them fiery. You say in the Hebrew language, fiery is because the, the bites were so painful. This was not just a bite and you fall off to sleep and death. This was a painful way to go. God had been protecting them from these bites until they decided to complain about the blessings. Lesson here. Don't complain about your life. Don't complain about what's going on in your life. Because more than likely, if you're following the Lord, it could be a lot worse. You have no clue what He's holding back from you right now. We have no right to complain about our lives to the God of heaven. More often than not, the reason we're in situations we're in, you can look in the mirror and see who's to blame. Amen? Again, you see in verse 5 that they referred back to Egypt, the world. They preferred slavery in the world to God's leading. Do we do the same? Question we have to ask ourselves. So I'll show you verse 14 too. They said they wish they were back in Egypt. 16.3 you brought us out of the land of milk and honey, which they are referring to Egypt, which is a total lie. Verse 20. Chapter 20, verse 5. Why have you made us come out of Egypt? And 21.5. Why have you brought us out of Egypt? These were yearning for the world. Brothers and sisters, this is a dangerous place to be. Do not yearn for the world and what's in it. The world is run by the devil and the world is a trap for you. It took God one day to bring Israel out of Egypt. It took Him 40 years to bring Egypt out of Israel. Once it's in, it's hard to eradicate. But if you give your lives fully over to God, He will take every bit of temptation from you. But you have to let Him take control. You have to trust in His Word. Amen? Amen? If you get nothing else from today, walk out of here that you will trust solely in God's Word. Amen. Not what men say. Amen. Not what tradition says. Amen. Not what the world says. Amen. But what this says. Amen. This is your path to freedom. This is the road map home. You follow this. You will live eternally. Amen. Guaranteed. Amen? Amen? So finally it took a thousands upon thousands dying from these serpent bites to stop the complaints. To stop the rebellion. 
then when they stopped rebelling, God could work through them. And you see in verse 21, they gave him a victory over King Sihon. In verse 33, they gave him victory over the mighty King Og. Now when Satan saw these victories, he was wroth again. Brothers and sisters, when we get a victory in Christ, don't think the devil's just going to roll over and let you keep on rolling. He's going to get mad. He's going to try to get back at you. He's going to intense the pressure on you. But don't let this discourage you either. Because we have a God in heaven that is more powerful than the devil. If you try to fight the devil on your own, you are no match. You will lose. But if you call on the Lord, claim His promises in His Word, the devil has no power over you and he will not be able to take you down in any way. The Word of God is your safety. Now Satan knew the children of Israel have been through all this. They've lost tens of thousands of people. He was going to have to change his approach in the rebellion. So the last rebellion that he used before they crossed over Jordan, they got to the banks of the Jordan. They could see the Holy Land. They could see the Promised Land. They could see the other side. Satan had to work in a different way. He had to work through apostasy. The king Balak brought in Balaam who was a false prophet to come in to curse the people of Israel. He was so fearful. He said, I need somebody to curse these people so they don't overrun us. As we know the story, in chapter 25, Balaam, God would not allow Balaam to curse the children of Israel. But he finally found a way to beat them. He set it up so the people would bring God's God's wrath down upon themselves. Look at chapter 25, verses 1 through 3. Chapter 25, verses 1 through 3. Here they are in the Acacia Grove on the banks of the Jordan River, ready to cross. Ready to cross. It says, Now Israel remained in Acacia Grove, and the people began to commit harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal of Peor, and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. As we know, the Midianite women came in. Balaam said, I can't curse them, but if you bring these people in and cause them to worship your gods, God will bring the wrath upon the children of Israel. So a plan was set forth to bring the Midianite women in in the guise of friendship. Even the leaders, and listen to this, listen to this, because this, right now, Satan is beating up our church with this rebellion, with this problem right now. Listen closely. They came in in the guise of friendship that not even the leaders distinguished it. Wow. Israel had committed harlotry with the world. Israel was bringing the world's ways into their worship. Not only were they out there in the groves worshiping with the Midianites, foreign gods, but they were bringing parts of that worship into their worship of the true God. This is where I'm telling you Satan is working hard in the churches today. He is allowing... The mixture of the holy and the profane. The holy and the common. We know what happened to two priests when they did that. When they played around with holy fire. When they put common fire in their censers. God struck them dead. God will not stand for the mixing of the holy and the common. Look at our... When you walk in the sanctuary, what does it say? Leviticus 19.30 You shall reverence... My sanctuary, brothers and sisters, we have to reverence the Lord. It's not bring in the way we think we want to worship God. One of the most deadly phrases is, what's wrong with it? Why can't I? Why can't we worship this way? It's deadly. Look to be the worship the way God wants you to worship. And that starts with reverence. Reverence is respect. All this jumping around, hooping and hollering crazy dance and that's not reverence of the Lord in the house of the Lord. I don't care how you slice it. We are to be 
reverence before the Lord. He has a set way. Amen? Amen? Amen. That is why in this church, we refrain from clapping. We refrain from the worldly music. Because we want to be reverent before the Lord. The best way we know how. And I remind you, in Proverbs 14, 12, says there is a way that seems right unto a man. It is a way that leads to death. I like better safe than sorry. Amen? This is a way mixing common worldly worship with holy worship that God that God had to destroy thousands more of Israelites when they could see the promised land on the other side. Brothers and sisters, we can see the promised land. We see all the signs in the world today. Jesus is coming soon. It's right there. Do not let Satan take you out right now. You've come too far. We've come too far. The Holy Land, the, the, the promised land is right there in our sight. Do not... Be taken out. Amen. Do not be taken out. Amen. Now these rebellions that Satan brought up in these 40 years accomplished two things. One, what God allowed to happen was a refining of His people. After each rebellion, there were some people refined and moved on and learned their lesson. How this correlates with us today, Revelation 3.19 it says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. We know Revelation 3.19 is the message to the church of Laodicea. The church of Laodicea is God's last church on this earth. The church of Laodicea is you and me, brothers and sisters. Amen. So through these rebellions that are happening today, God is refining a people. Why? Because He loves them and He wants them in the kingdom. Amen. Be zealous and repent. Now also, as their finding happens, there's also something called the shaking happens. In the desert, there was a tremendous shaking in that 40 years. Brothers and sisters, we know that there's a shaking going on today. It's going on as we stand here, as I stand here today, as you sit there. It's going on. There's alignment. There's different alignments. People are moving to the side. They have itching ears. They're moving to what they want to hear. Or they're standing on the Word of God. We all have a choice. God has to allow the shaking to happen because He has to shake the rebellious out, those that would be detrimental to the work. Because that's what we're getting to, brothers and sisters. Because we are on the banks of the Jordan. We have a serious work to do and we have a short time to do it and we need to get it done in a powerful way. And as long as our church has this rebellious attitude... Within it, there's confusion going on and God brings nobody into confusion. So God is allowing this shaking to happen so His goal can be taken care of. Let's read what it says here. It says, The Lord is soon to come. There must be a refining, winnowing process in every church. For there are among us wicked men who do not love the truth or honor God. We are in the shaking time, the time when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. The Lord will not excuse those who know the truth if they do not in word and deed obey His commands. Brothers and sisters, I'm really talking to most of us that have been in this church for a long time, and we know this church. We know the Word of God. We know what we're supposed to be doing. says, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen and was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. This will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony. They will rise up against it and this will cause a shaking amongst God's people. Brothers and sisters, you know you get the straight testimony from here. Do not let this testimony, what you've heard today, anger you. Because what you get from here is straight from the Word of God. It's not what I have to say. 
It's straight from the Word of God. Do not let it anger you because if it angers you, you're going to be allowed to be shaken out. And God wants that for not one of us. Amen? Amen. Satan wants to take you out. But we're in a time, I'm reminding you again, of God's infinite mercy. He's telling us, I want you in my kingdom. These are the things I need you to change. Now let's look at the last, last event recorded before, we, before they crossed the Jordan. And let's see what the parallels are for us today. Turn with me to Joshua 2, verses 9 through 11. Joshua 2, verses 9 through 11. This is important for each one of us who want to cross the Jordan, who want to spend eternity with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. God is waiting on us. Joshua 2, 9 through 11. We're talking that here we are with Rahab. The spies have been sent in secretly, by the way. Joshua sent these spies in secretly, it says, because he learned, he was one of those. Twelve spies earlier. He learned that if you get it out to the people, there could be some problems if one of those spies come back with a, with a lie. Amen? So he sent them in secret. Joshua 2, 9 through 11. says, And said to the men, this is Rahab speaking, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. She recognized the Word of God. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these sayings, our hearts melted, neither there did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. She's saying something. This is a heathen speaking. Someone that didn't know God, but she had heard about God. And she trusted it. This was a woman of faith. Amen? Amen. Now, Joshua sent these spies in. He had no idea what he sent them. He thought he sent them in to scout out the place. God had a plan. These spies were sent into the city of Jericho for one reason only. There was a family in there led by a woman, a harlot woman, that had a faith in a God that she didn't know. God sent these spies in to set up the saving of Rahab. And brothers and sisters, that is where we're at today. God's special goal is found in Luke 19.10, is to seek and save the lost. Amen? Why? Because His will. And His will is that none should perish. 2 Peter 3.9, that all should come to repentance. And if we love God, if we are His children, God's will should be our will. And everything in our lives should be working towards God's will, which is to seek and save the lost so that none are perish. And this is exactly what these two obedient spies did. They snuck into a hostile city. A city that if they found out about them, they would have killed them. As a matter of fact, when the king heard that the spies had come into Rahab's place, he's like, find out those men, where are they at? We, we want them. Rahab protected them from her own king because she trusted the Word of God. She trusted the Word of God and didn't even really know it. She trusted hearsay from what people had said about God. Look at us that know the Word of God and have a problem in our lives trusting the Word of God. Trust. The Word of God. God sent these two spies in to save this woman. This was not an ordinary woman. This woman, if you look at Matthew 1-5, through you will find she is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. She was one of Jesus' ancestors. And her, a harlot in that ancestor, shows us two things. Number one, 
that nobody is outside of God's grace and mercy. She may have lived that life of sin, but you know what? She repented, she learned of the true God, and she will be in the kingdom. She got to be in the ancestry line of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. 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 This was a woman of extraordinary faith. Her faith, and the faith of those spies as well, is a lesson for us today. It's a faith we are going to need. If we want to cross over into the heavenly Canaan, we are going to have to have an extraordinary, abundant amount of faith today. And that's the ultimate lesson for us today, brothers and sisters. God gave these men of faith an opportunity to save a woman of faith, a whole family. God knew that family was there and were ready and ripe for the truth. Today, God knows multitudes of families here in Houston. If we will only be obedient and faithful and step out in the hostile world, He will lead us to them and He will lead them to the kingdom. But are we up for the challenge? God is calling on us to show the world around us, specifically our mission field, Houston. There's many people here. Brother, pastor... Nigeria, your mission field. you got a job to do, brother. I praise the Lord that you're doing it faithfully. I'm sure you are. Because you understand, if you read the Bible like me, time is short. My brother from Switzerland, you understand the Word of God. Your mission field is Switzerland. May our prayers go with you and sister back to Switzerland and help your brothers and sisters see the truth and come to the love of Jesus Christ. All you, all our visitors today, wherever you may go, Go back. Share the love of Jesus. We have a mission. We have a mission that time is short and this mission has to be done. We have to give the gospel message to the whole world. Look at Matthew 24, 14. We are, as we're winding down, brothers and sisters, we're wrapping it up. Matthew 24, 14. There is a gospel message. A gospel message of Christ, our Lord and Savior, who died and resurrected, is coming again. He loves even the lowliest of sinner. Come to Him as you are, and He will change you. We, there's, there's a world of people out there waiting to hear just this. The devil's lying to them, telling them, oh, you're worthless. You have committed two farts, and you, you, are, you are unsavable. It's a lie. We need to go out there and tell them the truth of the Word, that it is a lie. That come to Christ, no matter where you are, what you have done. Come to Him in humble repentance and you can be saved just like the harlot Rahab. Amen. Matthew 24, 14. And it says, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations and then the end will come. Amen. Brothers and sisters, when God is waiting on us to share the message to the people He loves out there that He's waiting for us to reach. When we are done doing this, guess what? We get the reward. We get to go home. We get to get out of this kingdom. Come on, what are we waiting on? You love this planet? Apparently so. Apparently so. We love this too much. We love getting beat up on a daily basis by the devil. We can change it today. We can change it today. It starts in each one of our hearts. We as Seventh-day Adventists have a special, as this gospel that's been given the whole world, and then the end will come, we have a special portion of the gospel to share. We know it is a three angels message. Revelation 14, 6. It says, Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. This message that has to go out and then the end will come is the everlasting gospel that needs to go out to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Amen. And we'll just say with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him for the hour of His judgment has come. Worship Him who's made the heaven, earth, and sea and springs of water. You can read the rest all the way to 12 where He explains who these people are who will cross over the Jordan into the heavenly kingdom. The patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God in the faith of Jesus Christ. 
I ask you today, how many today are reaching their neighbors? How many today are talking to their friends and family about Jesus Christ and His soon coming? We're running out of time. We have a work to do. It is serious, brothers and sisters. We are all at a crossroads, especially this year. The heat is being turned up on us. It's being turned up out in the world. You can see it. You've seen the news. You see what's going on. It's being turned up. Time is so short. So short. There are decisions to be made. The door of mercy is slowly closing. Time is running out. But I tell you, that door of mercy is closing first for those that know the truth. We are privileged. We know the truth. What are we doing with it? Come to God. Ask Him, Lord, what can I do? What do you want me to do? Who do you want me to reach? Who is the Rahab in my life? Who is out there that is secretly wanting to know you? Lead me to them. Be faithful, He will. Trust in the Word of God that He will lead you and you will be victorious and you will not be harmed while you're out there. God will take care of you. You know one of our biggest problems? We're, we're, we're afraid of ridicule. We're afraid of being different from the world. We're afraid they'll make fun of us because of our beliefs. There's many people that can stand up to some physical abuse, but when you get ridiculed, Look at Peter. Peter was ready to fight for the Lord when they came after him, but then a little girl ridiculed him and he denied Christ three times. That's a lot of our problem today. Stand for the one that died for you. Stand for the one that died for you. And it's not even that long you have to do it. Stand strong, stand proud for the Lord. He's coming very soon. We've got a short time, a lot of work to do. But He's going to need each and every one of us to be part of the work. But what this work is going to require is a faith. A faith that led the spies into hostile territory to search out Rahab. And a faith that led this heathen woman to say that your God is the God of all heaven and earth below. We are living in a special period of this earth's history. A great work must be done in a very short time. And every Christian is to act a part in sustaining this work. God is calling for men who will consecrate themselves to the work of soul saving. We can never be saved in indolence and inactivity. There is no such thing as a truly converted person living a helpless, useless life. It is not possible for us to drift into heaven. It is not possible for us to drift into heaven. No sluggard can enter there. Those who refuse to cooperate with God on earth would not cooperate with Him in heaven. It would not be safe to take them to heaven. Remember, he said there's no more pain, no more suffering when we get there. This is why. All heaven is looking with intense interest upon the church to see what her individual members are doing to enlighten those who are in the darkness. All heaven is watching each one of us. What are we doing to help our brothers and sisters learn about the truth, the love of Jesus Christ, to learn about the truth, to learn about God's Word, to help them enter into the kingdom of heaven? What are we doing? There is a danger for those who do little or nothing for Christ. The grace of God will not long abide in the soul of Him who having great privilege and opportunities remains silent. How can you who repeat the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done, in earth as it is heaven, sit at ease in your homes without helping to carry the torch of truth to others? How can you lift up your hands before God and ask His blessings upon yourselves and your families when you are doing so little to help others? Yes, brothers and sisters, this is stepping on our toes, I know. But again, better hurt toes than burnt toes. We have a work to do and a short time to do it. Do you really want to enter the kingdom of heaven? You've got to answer for yourself. I can't answer for you. 
you can't answer for me. We all have a decision to make. We have a God of love. Love requires free will. Free will, we each have a decision to make. But brothers and sisters, I tell you, what is required, because we can't do it on our own. On our own, we're helpless. We're going to sit at home. We're not going to do anything if we trust in ourselves. We are going to need a faith that surpasses all understanding. A faith that will strengthen us and carry us through to cross the Jordan into the heavenly Canaan. Turn with me as we close in 1 John 5.4. It says, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Praise the Lord. And this is the victory that has overcome the world. Our faith. Our faith will overcome the world. And when you overcome the world, eternal life with Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is yours. Today, brothers and sisters, we need to believe, we need to have the faith like the spies. We need to have the faith like Rahab. Our God is a God in heaven above and on earth below, and He will see us through to the other side of the Jordan. He has promised. Trust in the Word. Trust in His Word. Step out. Get the work done. Share His Word with those that God puts in front of you. Amen? Amen. And the sooner we get this done the sooner we get to go home. Amen. Amen. Now again, these sermons, these messages are hard-hitting sometimes. But smile. Be joyful. You're in the Lord's house on the Sabbath. You've heard a message of mercy. This is not to beat anyone up. This is to prepare you for the kingdom that God wants you to live in. God wants each one of you and myself in the kingdom of heaven. He's pleading with us today. Please, please, trust in me. Trust in my word. Help me reach those that don't know me so I can bring you all home and get you out of the world of pain and suffering. You think we want off this planet? He wants us off this planet. Because we don't understand how painful sin is to Him. He has to endure it daily. He has to watch. We may lose a loved one in our life. He loses loved ones every second of every day. He watches the devil work, sin work, and the pain and suffering that's created in lives here on earth. And a God of love suffers strongly when He goes through pain. You can be assured of that. Praise the Lord we have a God of love. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord we're here today. God loves us and wants us in the kingdom. Come on, we got to be happy. we got a joyful noise unto the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your many blessings and your love. I thank you again for your message of mercy. I thank you for your Holy Spirit. I know you have delivered it to each one of our hearts exactly the way each one of us needs it, Lord. Let it stay there. Let it resound in our hearts and remind us that you're coming soon and we have work to do. Those that love you have work to do to help show your love to others, Lord. Help us, Lord. Many of us don't know how to do it don't know how to do these things, but you do. And if we trust in you and your word, you will show us and lead us how to lead others to you, Lord. We thank you for the love you've shown us every day. We thank you for the blessings you've given us. We thank you now for answering this prayer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.